Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the male accessory sex glands. Uh, so the accessory sex glands secrete most of the liquid portion of semen. Uh, so what we're going to talk about here are the accessory sex glands that is different from the testes, which are considered uh, primary uh, sex organs, uh, not accessory. So they're not like secondary um, sex organs, which is what we're talking about here. Um, so the testes produce fluid with semen, or sorry, with uh, sperm in it uh, that makes up some portion of semen. And what we're going to discuss here is what makes up the majority of the rest of the liquid portion of semen. Uh, so the accessory sex glands include the seminal vesicles, prostate, and bulbourethral glands, which we're going to talk about now. Uh, so the seminal vesicles, I think you can see my arrow, they're way back here. So there are two of them, a left and a right, all the way posterior, sort of between the bladder and the rectum. Um, so they secrete an alkaline viscous fluid. So alkaline, because in the female reproductive tract, it is acidic. Um, so in females, it's acidic to help uh, prevent infection and uh, helps minimize uh, growth of bacteria and yeast. Um, and so the female reproductive tract is acidic. So for sperm to survive in that acidic environment, uh, semen needs to be alkaline to protect them and allow them to be able to travel and, and not be destroyed. Um, so the seminal vesicles secrete an alkaline viscous fluid. So it's a thick sort of fluid uh, because if it was too thin, then when there was ejaculation in the female reproductive tract, if it was a thin fluid, then it would disperse too much and the sperm would not be protected. But because it's viscous and it sort of clots and stays together, it allows the sperm to stay in that sort of clotted alkaline fluid um, and not be harmed in that acidic environment. So it contains fructose, which provides energy for the sperm, um, something called prostaglandins, uh, which contribute to sperm motility, and it also stimulates muscular contraction in the female. So when there's ejaculation in the female reproductive tract, it will cause uh, muscular contraction inside the female, which is um, theorized to help draw the semen deeper into the reproductive tract, although uh, that, that may not be the case. That has not been um, demonstrated necessarily to be true scientifically, uh, but that is a theory and it has a funny name. It's, it's actually referred to as the upsuck theory um, that the semen is sort of sucked up deeper into the reproductive tract to uh, facilitate um, insemination. Um, and then also um, contains clotting proteins, different from clotting proteins that are in the blood, uh, but a different kind of clotting proteins, which is what causes semen um, to be viscous and sort of clumped together a little bit, again, so that it, it offers protection for the sperm, rather than if it was much thinner and didn't clot, then it would disperse more and the sperm would be vulnerable. Uh, so the secretions from the seminal vesicles make up about 60% of the total volume of semen. Okay, then the next one is the prostate. So there's one single prostate. Uh, it's right underneath the bladder and the urethra is running right through the center of it. So it's always described as a donut shaped gland about the size of a golf ball. Um, so it's like a little golf ball sitting right underneath the bladder like we see in the picture here and then has a hole right through the middle where the urethra coming down from the bladder is passing right through the center of the prostate and then out the other side and then down through the penis um, so that um, so that's the path of the urethra for urination. Um, that's why somebody who has prostate dysfunctions would have urinary symptoms is because uh, the prostate is surrounding the urethra and sitting directly underneath the bladder. Um, so if the prostate is enlarging, it could be pressing into the bladder, which could increase feelings of needing to urinate uh, or frequency of urination. And it also can be encroaching on the urethra itself, which could make urination more difficult. Um, like it could make the person feel like they have to push the urine more than just relieve, like just releasing muscles and allowing the urine to flow. Um, so that's why prostate 
has a lot of urinary symptoms. Um, so it's inferior to the urinary bladder, surrounds the upper part of the urethra. Um, so as children, it slowly increases in size while kids are growing. Uh, so from birth to puberty, and then during puberty, it expands very rapidly in response to uh, hormones that are circulating during puberty. Uh, then from ages 30 to 45 or so, it, it remains pretty stable in size. And then after age 45, in some men, it, it begins to enlarge further. Uh, so that does not happen in every man and how quickly it enlarges and how and whether that uh, causes any kind of symptoms or dysfunction, it's different in everyone. Um, it is thought that if every man lived long enough that they would experience some, um, some symptoms or some effects of an enlarged prostate. Uh, but what that is saying is that in some men it might happen when they're 45 and some it might happen when they're 85. Um, and in some, maybe 105, but the theory is that it eventually would enlarge in most men, um, but there's extreme amount of variability of when that happens and to what extent and whether that is causing any sort of dysfunction. Um, so the prostate secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid that contains citric acid. That's why it's slightly acidic. It's, it's giving citric acid, which is another energy source for the sperm. Uh, acid phosphatase, which as far as I know, still is unknown why, why it's contained there. And then also some uh, protein digesting enzymes. And the fluid from the prostate makes up about another 25% of semen. Okay, so seminal vesicles, 60%, prostate about 25%, and the remaining 15% would be the fluid containing the sperm coming from the testes and the epididymis through the duct system. Okay, so the last glands are bulbourethral glands, and these are not secreting um, fluid that is part of semen. These have a little bit of a different function. Um, so there are two tiny glands, and we can see them in the picture here. They're inferior to the prostate. So there's two, there's a left and a right. Um, they secrete an alkaline substance into the urethra during arousal. So these are not secreting fluid that are part of uh, ejaculatory fluid. Uh, instead, this is secreting fluid that is being, um, that's emitted, I guess is the right word. Uh, it's secreting fluid that's emitted uh, during arousal, so before ejaculation. Uh, so it's secreting fluid that would be considered pre-ejaculatory fluid. Uh, so it's alkaline, because its purpose is to go out through the urethra and neutralize the acidity of the urethra. Um, because most often um, urine was the last thing to pass through the urethra before ejaculation. So this secretion goes through and sort of cleans out the, the very acidic urine um, so that when the sperm is coming, when the sperm are coming through that they're not damaged by um, that acidic environment. Uh, it also secretes mucus, uh, which lubricates the end of the penis and the lining of the urethra, uh, lubricating the lining of the urethra so that when the sperm pass through, um, there's less frictions, there's less damage to the sperm as they're passing through the urethra. Okay, so the secretions from the bulbourethral gland, both the alkaline secretion and the mucus, and usually mixed together, uh, that would be pre-ejaculatory fluid. Um, and then there's always the question of can someone become pregnant from pre-ejaculatory fluid? And the answer is sometimes. Um, so I have read studies about this where uh, they actually were, were testing to see um, does pre-ejaculatory fluid contain sperm? And the answer was that in some men it does and in some men it doesn't. And in the men when it that do have sperm in the pre-ejaculatory fluid that they always had it. And then in the men where it didn't have sperm in the pre-ejaculatory fluid, they never had it. Um, so if the man has sperm in the pre-ejaculatory fluid, then it could certainly cause pregnancy. And if not, then it would not cause pregnancy. Uh, so that's sort of an interesting case uh, where it's either this person always has it or this other person never has it. Um, and one could only know if they had it tested, which no one is doing. 
Uh, so assume that you can become pregnant from pre-ejaculatory fluid because you don't know um, if the, the person um, has sperm in the pre-ejaculatory fluid or not. Okay, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you for the next video.